Ariana with ACE and we're reporting from COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland with Hala thomas Dottier from B-Team. Hi Hala. Hi Ariana, great to be here with you. Yes, today we're going to talk about government and corporate accountability. Um, so what does real accountability from our governments look like to you? Well, we need our governments to let us all leave Glasgow knowing that 1.5 is still alive. So that is like the number one objective to get out of here. Number two, we need our governments in the global north to take responsibility that the way we've been behaving is really taxing the global south. So we need to make sure that the 100 billion is actually going to be available to the more climate vulnerable countries and it needs to be available not just as debt and the debt does not need to be given at the high interest rates, it needs to be given in, as an investment mm -hmm. in all of our collective futures. And then I would say, last but not least, we need our governments to put the right rules in place so that corporate accountability for their total impacts on the things that matter, like the environment, the social fabric and good governance, is actually captured in the definition of success. And so I'd say those three things, if we can come away with that, um, this COP will be incredibly successful. Yeah, do you feel like um, our governments feel accountable to youth and young people? Not nearly as much as they should be, nor does the corporate sector, to be honest. But increasingly, I think the private sector understands that this is a talent issue. We can no longer attract or retain talent if we don't place climate on the agenda and responsibility for nature and responsibility for diversity and inclusion and responsibility for the right metrics in business. So talent wants this. So I think the private sector is getting that more. I think our governments, honestly, are letting us down a little more now than private sector, meaning that I um, think they're struggling with moving into the courageous action that we need from them. And they're a little bit too much catering to the short-term horizon. And so I think your generation is key to helping us shift from the short-termism that is pervasive everywhere to the long-term mindset we need. You know, leaders often talk about bold and ambitious climate action, but to me, it feels very small and incremental. Mm -hmm. um, how do you feel about that and what can we do to change that? Yeah, I don't disagree. We are not on track to deliver the future that we need and you deserve. There's absolutely no doubt about that. I want to celebrate our wins along the way, though, and I think we are seeing finance moving now more than ever before, and I think we have more companies in the private sector really committing to the long-term vision of net zero by 2050, but still not enough of them. I think we now need to talk a lot more about 2030 and what we're going to do now. And we need to halve our emissions by 2030. And that, to me, means that right now we need to think about how do we change who is around every decision-making table so we can change how we do things. And your generation, more women, more people of color, more people from the global south are critical to helping us drive this transformation because more of the same is just gonna give us more of the outcomes that we now are facing. Uh, one crisis on top of another, we're living on a burning planet with a broken social contract and that just isn't gonna work. And so we need to disrupt the conformity and leadership Absolutely. to change that. Yeah. So how do we make climate the number one priority in everyone's mind? I actually think that um, it may sound simple, but I really think putting more women and people of the next generation around every decision-making table in the world is going to make that happen. Yes. I have seen personally being at the forefront of um, advocating for women on boards that when women sit around the boardroom table, the agenda becomes more expensive and is more inclusive of climate, environment, social issues and good governance. And the same thing I'm increasingly seeing when people of color have a voice and when the next generation has a voice. And in the Nordic countries and in lots of places in Europe, we see workers often having seat at the table. That changes everything. Mm -hmm. I think when, uh, when the talent becomes a shareholder, yes. I think the talent can maybe drive some of the transformation that we need from our, um, our leaders in the elite. But at the end of the day, Ariana, I will be very honest with you. I don't think we can drive the transformation we need only from the elite or those in existing positions of power. We need to do it by unlocking leadership in all of us. There's not a single person on this planet that shouldn't care about this transition. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of this is about unlocking leadership and thinking not that leadership is going to come from somewhere else, but look inside mm -hmm. and ask ourselves, what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. How am I going to show up? 
what kind of a leader am I going to choose to be at a critical moment for humanity like we've never seen before? Yeah. So there's no one answer. We need governments, we need private sector, we need uh, women and men and the generations and, and the global divides to be bridged and closed and come together. Absolutely, yes to diversifying and changing the table, yeah. you know. Um, well, first we need to change who to change how, <laughs> yeah. and then when we do that, we can actually change the table. Yes. But yes. it starts by having the voices who see yeah. the challenges mm -hmm. to help solve them. We can't solve challenges that boardrooms are blind to. Mm -hmm. And I am afraid most of the boardrooms I know and most mm -hmm. of the governmental discussions I have uh, an eye on are male, pale, and stale. <laughs> I'll just put it like that. <laughs> okay, thank you for putting it that way. Um, so what do you think? Is climate change an emergency? It sure is. What can we call um, it when we know that over 50 countries contribute less than 5% of CO2 in the world and yet are drowning, not just from climate change, but also from the debt that um, they're debt ridden with uh, unsustainable levels of credit being put on them to try to transition. Mm -hmm. That is an emergency. What can we call it when our young generation is so full of anxiety because they see that we are not creating the future that they need and deserve. And so I think it is an emergency. There's no doubt about it. But I don't think we treat it yet as the crisis that it is. Mm -hmm. I think we're still talking a little more than we are acting. Um, but I am encouraged by the fact that I rarely meet leaders anymore who say we don't have a problem. And mm -hmm. that happened a lot just a few years ago. So I would say most people are starting to be awake and COVID was an awakening for us in many ways. A harsh awakening, but an awakening. And so I think our consciousness is, is being raised. And now how do we use that consciousness to come together and collaborate like never before is going to be a critical next step because we don't have a lot of time. And I think maybe if we focus only on the crisis and the emergency, and even if it is, then it might be hard for people to act because fear has a tendency to paralyze us. And, and I think hope springs action and action springs hope. And so I would like to encourage all of us to start talking a little bit more about the, what we dream of and start co-creating and co-designing what kind of a world we dream of. Because as human beings, I think we dream of a similar thing. Yeah. We want to be able to breathe clean air. We want to give our kids a fighting chance. We want to be healthy. We want to eat food that doesn't kill us. We want to live in communities that are not divided but are united. I think we care about the same things. But when we focus on the fear, the division runs deeper and maybe inaction is the consequence and we need action now. So I try to find, be a stubborn optimist or even a prisoner of hope that yeah. we will meet this moment. And I've seen humanity do incredible things. And if we're awake, if we're conscious, if we're aware of what we're facing and we can turn that into energy that is forward moving, I actually believe um, that we will lead the transformation that we need and, and, and your generation deserves. But I'm not trying to be blind to the challenges or the emergency, but I'm trying to shift our mindset mm -hmm. from saying we've lost this fight to saying no, we've still got it. 1.5 is still alive if we choose to make it. Thank you so much for your optimism and for your work. Um, stay tuned for more youth reporting from ACE. Thank yeah. you for reporting from here. Yeah. Thank you.